Hi, and welcome to episode 53 of the Breaking Bio podcast. I'm Morgan Jackson, a PhD student at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. Uh, I'm the artist formerly known as Bug Girl, uh, and I blog at Wired about bugs. <laughs> <laughs> and today we're joined with my special guest, Dr. Jessica Light, who's an associate, sorry, an assistant professor at Texas A&M University. You want to say hi, Jessica, and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Hi, everyone. I really wish I was an associate professor, so I don't have to go through what I'm about to go through next semester. Um, but yeah, hopefully that will happen pretty soon. Um, like Morgan said, I'm an assistant professor at Texas A&M University, and my main line of research is host parasite associations. Um, primarily with mammals and parasites, uh, which are insects, lice to be specific. And I've kind of followed that theme throughout my career from graduate school to postdoc to where I am now, and I'm trying to pass on the love of host parasite associations and insects to my graduate students and undergraduate students. Awesome. So as everybody at home could probably guess, if you've been a long-time viewer and knowing that Bug Girl is on the podcast this week... <laughs> You can probably guess where this podcast is going to go at some point. Yay. It doesn't have to. <laughs> I think I it have, has to. I have <laughs> other interests in my life, okay? <laughs> Jessica, thank you very much for joining us this week. I, I'm looking forward to it because I'm, I'm also quite uh, fascinated by lice, even though I have absolutely no idea about them. I, I just I think they're cool. They are. As long as they're not involved with me. <laughs> True, yeah. That's the best kind of lice. Somebody yes. else Somebody, Somebody else's else is outside of your house. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so you work. You said you worked on on mammal lice and and lice taxonomy and such and and how they co-evolve. So, are you working on? We'll start right at the beginning. Are you working on lice that evolve people or lice that evolve other problem? Uh, sorry, on other animals. I started out with other animals, and I'm kind of back to that again. So, for my dissertation research, I worked on two different rodent groups, um, subterranean or fossorial, rather, pocket gophers, which I had never seen before I started graduate school because I grew up in Michigan and we didn't have pocket gophers there. So I go to grad school, go on my first field expedition, and there are big pocket gophers everywhere. And um, that initially started out as supposed to be side projects for me and then became a major component of my dissertation just because of the amount of work and effort and time spent with them. And then the other mammal group I worked with were... Um, another type of rodent called heteromyid rodents, which are found in the U.S. and the western U.S., and the ones that we're most closely familiar with are kangaroo rats, the so little bipedal kangaroo-like rodents that are hopping around at the desert at night, and I looked at the parasites on them. Um, these two different rodent groups actually have two different types of lice, and we can talk about that more if we're interested, but the pocket gophers have chewing lice, um, which are feeding primarily in skin dander from the from the gophers, and then the heteromyids, those kangaroo rats, have sucking lice, which are exactly the same kind of lice that humans are parasitized with. So I started out with these two different rodent groups and two different louse groups, and then when I moved on to my postdoc at the University of Florida, that's when I entered the human realm a little bit more <laughs> with projects on um, humans and other primates and... I'm still continuing with that, sort of, just tangentially, and now I'm back to rodents and their lice again. So don't most chewing lice occur on birds? Isn't that yes. more common for birds? There's a roughly, I'm gonna, I hope I don't botch the number, about 3,000 species of chewing lice, and the majority of them are on birds. And based on some work that we've done, it looks like there have been a couple of instances of host switches from a bird host to a mammal host, and that's why we have small groups of mammals having these, um, these chewing lice parasitizing them. And then the sucking lice are only on mammals. We don't find those on birds at all. They're only on mammals. Interesting. Huh. I didn't realize it. This is this is my basic level of lice understanding. <laughs> understanding. I, I hadn't realized that there was such a strong divide between those two. In that yeah, and, and that's like an old taxonomic divide too, because it gets complicated. Because within the chewing lice, there are ones you know that feed on blood. So you have to be semantically careful if you're talking about blood feeding lice. Do you mean the sucking lice, which do all feed on blood, mm. or do you mean specific lineages of chewing lice that also feed on blood? Ugh. That have converged on blood feeding. Huh. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's 
<laughs> I'm the other thing that I'm surprised at is how few species. I assumed that there was more species of chewing lice than that, but um, I'm shocked to hear that it's only three thousand. Is that a fairly good estimate, or do you think that's going to grow pretty exponentially? Because I assume that lice are fairly understudied. Yeah, there's you know I could name lots of, or the majority of the Laos researchers probably on two hands that are out there, so I do think that the majority of, of Laos taxa are severely understudied, and the more sampling that people do in the field and collecting the lice, and then the more, hopefully more alpha taxonomists we can get trained, the more identifications of new species that we'll find. So I, I do expect that number will go up for sucking, um, for chewing lice and for sucking lice. There's only about 550 species of sucking lice, so that's even further reduced. Wow. I would suspect that some of that is limited by the close ties between the vertebrate species and the invertebrate species. So because mammal diversity is, is lower, I would expect there to also be less um, Laos diversity in part limited, although there's there's multiple species on single birds, like the pelican pouch lice. Oh, Freaky! Yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> they're cool. Uh, and so, and they're very cool, yeah, but also just, um, and I would love to write a story about that, by the way, if you can hook me up with some cool pictures. Uh, okay. But there's, I mean, the one of the things I've seen that's really interesting is this argument that about Laos conservation. Um, and yeah. so when we have um, endangered mammals or endangered birds and they have their own species of lice, should we be as concerned about preserving the lice as we are about the vertebrates? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, <clears throat> as a parasitologist, or at least dabbling in the field of parasitology, these are organisms that exist on Earth. And for the most part, unless infestations are extremely, extremely high, they're not doing that much to their host overall. So if they're, not, if they're not that bad, why worry about trying to eradicate them by any means? And then if there's this general theme of conserving biodiversity, that includes parasites, including lice. I mean, these are fauna that do serve a role, and roles that we may not be entirely clear on what they're doing. We just might say, bam, parasite. But they might be doing other things that might, you know, who knows, even benefit their host in some sort of way. So is exsanguination relatively rare then? Yeah, by lice. Yes. Um, yes. I've, <laughs> Not by people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so. I mean, I, um, as part of my dissertation field research, I caught, either I caught or somebody else caught, a small little rodent called uh, Perignathus. It's a pocket mouse. <clears throat> it's one of those heteromyid rodents. I don't know, maybe it was 12 grams, excuse me, <clears throat> totally infested with lice. <laughs> Hundreds. When, I, when I, uh, I, I did a little washing protocol to try to get as many of the lice off as possible, and I, in looking at the animal, I had no idea it was infested. Its health looked good, um, body size, coloration, everything looked good, and then I start washing the animal, and all these lice start floating to the surface of the, the wash <laughs> bottle. I'm like, holy cow. So... On that instance, I think exaggeration is rare, and there's also this, this common trend in, in parasites with infestation loads, where it seems like a majority of a host population is not highly infested, um, maybe just a couple of individuals of parasites, and then you have one or two individuals that are loaded. So those individuals, those hosts are still able to survive based on my one observation, my N of 1, um, and the parasite and the host are able to keep interacting over time without you know, significant damage to that host. So you touched on it there, and I think it's an interesting point because when we're talking about things that are tiny and people know how hard perhaps uh, head lice are to get rid of, how do you actually go about collecting you know, other species of lice in the wild? Um, there's multiple methods, but yeah, we're gonna. There's a big issue with the fact that they're small. And I remember my first field expedition where I was looking for these lice with no search image, and we were down in Mexico, and I was working on this one rodent that, um, once it has been euthanized, it tends to rot fairly quickly. 
and my advisors were behind me, like, come on, like, find the life, let's go. Like, this animal can be really difficult to prepare and process. And But I had no idea what I was looking for. So that's the battle number one, is when you're going in the field, you should have a search image. Once you, and so now I have, like, files saved on my computer when folks ask me about looking for parasites. I'm like, here's a couple pictures to get you started, because... Um, at least in rodent lice, God, they're small. They're really small. Yeah. So depending on what kind of study you're doing, there's different ways that you can get the lice. What I ended up doing, um, because it was necessary to have the louse specimens as well as host DNA to do some of the downstream analyses I wanted to do, we humanely euthanized the host, which allowed me to bring their skins back to the lab and do a very careful monitoring of, of looking for those ectoparasites. I could take my time. There was no rush anymore. Um, and there was a paper study, uh, or a study that came out of Dale Clayton's group, um, and I think Devin Drown was, was a co-author on it, about different ways to get the highest number of lice <laughs> off a host. And the best method was a, a, a paint shaker. <laughs> a paint shaker that they use you know, at Lowe's or Home Depot, and you put your animal in it. <laughs> with some water and some detergents, and you then filter that water and all your lice stick to the filter and you're good to go. I so, couldn't afford a paint shaker, so I got a plastic bottle with a lid and I shook the crap out of that, and then that's how I got the majority of my lice, at least for my dissertation project. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just imagining somebody walking into Home Depot and going, so this is kind of weird, but can I put this paint jar with a rat in it in your paint shaker? Oh, yeah, now we Five have our own paint do. shakers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I shudder to think what the rat looks like after that. But, um... You know, <laughs> you know because we have water and detergent in there, they actually come out really nice. I mean, you need to dry their fur later, but you end up having a very clean um, skin after that process. So oh, There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so so that works for small things that you can fit into a paint can. What about um, what about larger larger things like I assume that large animals like deer and and moose and other antelopes and stuff like that or or big carnivores have have lice as well. So are those you're stuck with going literally through with a with a nick comb or Yes and no. So those larger animals also as a byproduct tend to have larger lice one of those nice little um, trends that we see. So you, on, on those bigger animals with that don't have dense fur, you could probably just do eye scans, maybe have some forceps to push some fur out of the way, and you can find your lice that way. There's also tendencies of lice to uh, accumulate or at least be in high numbers in certain areas where it's difficult for the animal to get to grooming, so like underarms um, tends to be a good place, like on the back between the shoulder blades is another place. So you end up having, depending on the animal you're working with, you know you're going to go here, here, or here on their body to look for lice. Nick combs are very handy for animals with denser fur because it's really hard to get through that fur and look for the lice on them. So we, I have a stock you know, of, of the best nick combs that are out there, we think, and I'll, I'll use those or I'll send them out to people. If I'm looking on museum specimens, which I have done before, I've looked at some like random gorillas that were at the Natural History Museum in London, and I had them out on a table, and I was using forceps just going through their fur to see what I could find. Um, so it, I think it's a combination of eye, looking by eye, and then depending on the fur quality of the animal you're working with, those nick combs really do come in handy. Uh, all right. Well, I'm going to continue to roll with that because so. You <laughs> So you can secondarily collect lice off of preserved museum specimens? Yes. They tend to dry up. You know, just like your museum specimen also dries up, the lice dry up, so it does make identification a little bit difficult. Um, if you want to do any genetic work with them, there's almost certainly a time frame in which you can probably get DNA out of those lice. But, yeah, you can find them. I remember one... I think it was a macaque specimen at the Natural History Museum in London that was covered in nits. Nits. I couldn't find any adult lice, um, but there were nits everywhere, all over its face, over portions of its body. It was incredible. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess it makes sense, as you know, the rest of the insects in the in these collection would be all dried up and ready to go. But it never really dawned on me that you could find, you know, parasites living in the specimens. 
Yeah, some of it depends. There's there's interesting variability there on how the animal was processed, um, all the way back to how it was actually initially killed um, to become part of that collection. So if animals are, are euthanized via gas or something like that, that kills the parasites at the same time. So it becomes ectoparasites. So you can gather them later pretty easily. If an animal was shot and left out for a while, or if it was in... Um, some sort of snap trap, the host body temperature comes down and then a lot of those ectoparasites will flee trying to find another host if you don't get to that host in sufficient time to get the ectoparasites. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it also makes looking and collection sometimes difficult because we don't have the story on each specimen. Mm. We don't know exactly what the process was. So you can spend hours, days looking for... Um, parasites, and you might have a full series where you don't find anything, and a lot of those could have just been snap traps left there for a while before they were processed. So, so your lab does a lot of work on coevolution between mammals and their lice. Uh, um, do you see a lot of co-speciation, or are uh, there's not as much of a tie? Or you know, as a mammal group diverges, do you see their lice diverging with them, or is there more of a generalist specialist thing going on? There's both. There's both going on. So um, initially, when I was in graduate school and then as a postdoc, I did do a lot of an, you know assessments of is there a co-speciation between the host and the parasites. And I've since gotten away from that a little bit. I'm trying to look at more um, population level aspects of what's going on with a population of parasites on one host or within a geographic locality and trying to better understand that for what's happening at the higher level. But it ends up becoming a very complicated situation depending on you know, what, what scale or what level taxonomic-wise are you talking for the level of co-divergence or co-speciation. So at very broad scales within mammals, if you put a mammal tree up of all the mammal orders that have lice against the lice that we know from them, it's co-switching like crazy. There's crisscrossing lines. There's not overall co-speciation at that broad scale. Um, why? Still don't know. It could have something to do with very rapid radiations in the host, uh, followed by subsequent rapid radiations and some host switch with the parasites, making it difficult to track. But if you look within one particular lineage, like say pocket gophers or heteromyid rodents or primates, then we start to see more signal of co-speciation. So at smaller scales, it, it does appear that it might it might be there, at least in some mammal groups, but at higher scales, not so much. And I think the story might be pretty similar for birds and their parasites as well. So we might as well go ahead and talk about primate <laughs> lice. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and and the pair of lice lost. Yes. <laughs> That's the title of the paper, Morgan. <laughs> it is the title of the paper. Dale Clayton at the University of Utah came up with that. Well, it, it, I, I really, I think the work in terms of using um, lice with essentially anthropology is pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. So things like dating early human movements. Um, and I think you've been in on a few of those, yes? A couple of them, yeah. Most of that, most of the human-associated stuff is staying at my postdoc lab with David Reed, who is the, the PI of that lab over there. But I'm still tinkering a little bit with primate lice when I can. As one does. As one does, <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> that did sound bad. <laughs> no, I liked it. <laughs> Which probably means it sounded not so great. Um, Yay! <laughs> it's fine with me, though. And I'm sure it'll be fine with the viewers, so it's great. I, well, I was about to say, I would totally tinker with primate lice if I could, and then I thought, no, bad idea. Oh, you That's... know what's hard about it yep, is like yep. getting the people working it's on take from the Morgan. primate. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult to actually get the primate lice because the yes. hosts are so difficult to work with. So we're very much so dependent on opportunistic collecting and collaborators and then trying to piggyback on field trips mm -hmm. and get into the field to work with, with some of these mostly, gosh, endangered or listed primate species. Yes. Yeah. Mm. That's a really interesting question. I hadn't really thought about lemur lice. Um, interestingly, uh, 
we have a, through a collaborator of a collaborator is actually working on lemurs, and she recently had a paper studied in one of the open access journals, and I'm forgetting which one it was. I think one of the PLOS journals, and mm -hmm. she did some crazy marking of lemur lice to see how they were transferring among hosts. It was like nail polish or some wow. fluorescent label or something. Um, so she was. She had all the permissions to work on these Madagascar lemurs and was doing the work and then just, you know, doing this, uh, the Lao stuff on the side, which is pretty amazing. So once you can get someone who's in the system and kind of working with one of these endangered species, then you can hopefully piggyback on a bunch of other various projects associated with it. Madagascar is cool. There's so many questions I'd like to ask about yeah. the life that are there, where they came from. Um, and does it kind of follow suit with what happened with mammals? I have, I'm, my mind is blown by somebody doing a mark recapture study on, on lemur lice. Like that is. I know it's so <laughs> that's cool. It's actually of... I need to email her. <laughs> there's there's some kind of disturbing early mark recapture with crab lice on humans. Really? Yeah, it's it it apparently the I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen a couple of papers. Uh, the what the part I liked the best though, and what made this pop into my head was the description of how the crabs moved, and they they basically described it as swinging from hair to hair like a chimpanzee yeah. in a forest. I, I've seen that description too, which is really crazy. <laughs> and they're doing it. The other thing that I think is surprising is I believe they're we're, doing it. We're on losing the Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> the mental images this early in the morning are. Uh... <laughs> They're pretty great. Here, so. <laughs> let me add more. Um, <laughs> I believe it's their third pair of legs that they're doing the swinging from. So it's not the first pair, or the second pair. It's the third. And oh. and we can so get back swinging to, upside down. Yeah, we can get back to paralyzed lost uh, with this one. And that third pair of legs are perfectly spaced for the hair diameter on gorilla hair. So that species of crab louse that's found on gorillas and perfectly spaced for hairs in the pubic region. So we tend to see at least human pubic lice pretty much staying in the pubic area and only hanging out in other odd places based on hair diameter so that they can use those two legs to hang on to the hairs. Ugh, it's funky crazy. <laughs> So that's a, that's a good point to, to bring up, which I, I doubt many people have thought about, honestly, or, you know, no, on top of that is is the sister species of the human crab louse would be found on... Gorillas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, as people I, contemplate I, that at home, <laughs> is there a good explanation for when or how that um, relationship, perhaps... <laughs> Evolved? No, they're hypotheses. Um, I don't know if any of them are good, but they could all be equally valid. We we did a this pair of lice loss paper that Bug mentioned earlier. We used genetic data to try to track what was happening with the lice and their associations with the humans. And with that data, we were able to estimate some splitting times or divergence times between the various louse species. And those two theorist species, um, gorilla on gorilla and then uh, pubis on humans split about three to four million years ago. So this wasn't too recent, which makes us all very happy, right? We don't want to think about a very recent host switch of crab lice from gorillas to humans. And it tells us a couple of different things about what might have been happening, how ancestral humans look three to four million years ago to allow that host switch. So some of the hypotheses we have about what ancestral humans looked like at that time is that those homonyms, which might have been um, genus Australopithecus, might have been having loss of body hair at that time, becoming more naked ape, and having secondary sexual characteristics like pubic hair to indicate that individuals were sexually um, receptive and able to reproduce. Because you would think for that host switch from gorillas to have been successful, there had to be an open niche, something where the hair spacing was adequate, which we don't believe is the head. It could have been other places on the body, and as that hair was moving away and kind of then concentrating in the pubic region for adults. The other thing, let me see if I remember everything, that this 
also tells us this three to four million years ago split between the two crab lice is how humans and those gorillas or ancestral humans and gorillas might have been interacting. And this is where the fun starts and the popular press picked up on this and they had a great time. Um, but it could be as, as simple as predation. Maybe humans were, were preying on gorillas and a host switch happened, that niche was available and it took off. Maybe it could have been nest sharing. We know that gorillas tend to move their nests nightly. So maybe ancestral humans were coming around and using vacated nests soon after gorillas were there. And then there's the fun one, which is the hanky-panky between ancestral humans and gorillas, that maybe there was some sort of, of interaction sexually going on between these ancestral primates, facilitating that host switch to occur. Those are our top three. Um, do we know which one? No idea. And we'll never know, but uh, it's fun to talk about. Yeah, I, I find the nest sharing the most plausible of those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll just, just, we'll just go with that one. <laughs> yes, we will, Morgan. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time at this point. Um, oh, wow. So that's a great spot to end the, the podcast on as far as I'm concerned. So <laughs> everybody at home, you can just think about that as long as you want to. Um, yeah. And so, so as we wrap it up here, uh, where can people follow along with, with your work and, and the things you're doing with uh, lice around the world? I'm trying to be better uh, with an online presence. So I do have a, a Twitter account, and um, I believe that's J-E underscore light, L-I-G-H-T. I also have a, a university website where I kind of have a, a Twitter-like page on it, but it's not updated nearly as much as Twitter. So I think Twitter is going to be my best online presence where I'm trying to update what's going on with my work and my students' work while highlighting other cool things that are going on in science. And then sometimes I talk about my kid. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fair. <laughs> That sounds good. Awesome. So I'd like to thank you, Jessica, for coming on the show this week. And for anybody at home that's listening, you can find us online at BreakingBio on Twitter or at BreakingBio.com to find the blog and all of our past episodes. And you can find us on Facebook as well by searching for the Breaking Bio podcast. That's it for this week, and we hope you'll join us next week when we have a new guest who's probably less than us. Awesome.